moderator, Jana Rust, who's a partner with Thompson Coburn and a longtime friend of Melwood. Um, and Jana, I'll let you take it away. Yep. Now, okay. I was going to say, now I can hear myself. Uh, I always hear myself. Um, but thank you for that introduction. And I'll go ahead and introduce our, a couple of our two panelists here. And I, I will apologize now for not being here the rest of the conference. And I'm saying this before I introduce you, Art. It's because I just got back late last night from Penn State, which is where I understand <laughs> you are from. And sorry, I spent the last two days in State College for work, so I apologize. Well, I maybe it's the hangover from the last uh, tailgate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am a Missouri girl, so I was not cheering on Penn State. Um, but I was there, beautiful campus. And Art, um, as I mentioned, is a graduate of Penn State, but more importantly for y'all, he is an account executive at Cherokee Federal Defense Health, and full name, Art Spring. Um, at Cherokee Federal Defense Health, he helps support the military health system in digital transformation and IT modernization. And while, while doing that, he brings in his financial, operational, and technical um, expertise and change management to help his federal clients. Um, obviously, then, he has a background in business operations and federal IT program management. Next to him, we have Mark Kessler, who is the VP of Innovation and Business Development at Global Connections to Employment, which I believe goes by GCE more, more often than not. And there he is responsible for identifying and growing new and um, not yet mature lines of business for GCE. Um, he does that by helping create substantial employment opportunities for, per, for persons with significant disabilities in the public sector, so, uh, as well as the commercial sectors. He's also responsible for developing and executing innovation strategies and aligning his um, GCE's strategic business goals and growth priorities. So is there anything else that I missed, gentlemen, that I should add? Uh, I was a, a North and Central American Indian archaeology major in college, and so, um, you know, you have to kind of go get a job when you have a degree like that. Uh, but uh, my coming on board with, uh, with Cherokee, to me, is kind of a capstone for my career, and so just to tie it back to Penn State, is that um, Cherokee had called and asked if I would come in and help them out, and, uh, you know, to me, that was a great way to uh, kind of draw a big circle, right, life cycle around, you know, my own education and now be able to make a contribution. So. I think what Mark and I are going to talk about really is along those lines, right? Of kind of like, yeah. where, where's our passion? What do we really believe in? And, um, you know, how did it drive us to do what we do? And I barely made it through college. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Look at me today, right? <laughs> no, all joking aside, we were very thankful and excited that we got invited to come speak on this panel. And Art and I are very active and passionate about what we have built here as far as this relationship goes. Yeah, look, we're the four o'clock session too, so the bottom line is that, you know, if you've lasted this long, make sure you get out of it what you can. Feel yeah. free to ask us any questions. And we're not experts, right? We're people that are on a journey together. And uh, we're learning more and we're finding ways to kind of navigate some fairly complex uh, regulations and things like that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, you believe in it. Uh, you're answering your customers' needs, and you're trying to find a way to get these two worlds to merge uh, and to come up with a solution that works for everybody. All right. Well, um, before I start on the questions, which I think are really going to jump off right where you, you were ending, I did want to note that I, I know the idea for this panel came out of some discussions from last year when we were talking about how do these relationships start for um, NPEs that are, I'm sorry, NPAs that are looking to build a relationship with a larger prime contractor, how do they start? And one of the things we were talking about last year is it's not something that happens overnight. It does take time. And so I love the comment of, you know, that this is a journey y'all are on. Mm -hmm. um, but for folks here who aren't familiar with you all, could you give us a description of your two entities' relationships and how, um, that relationship developed over time? Yeah, do you want me to start, Mark? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I represent Cherokee Federal, and um, for those that may not be familiar, we're uh, what's considered a tribal 8A contractor in the federal government. Uh, Cherokee uh, is the um, largest 
tribal nation, right? Native, uh, Native nation. They've been in this business for a fairly short time in federal contracting. You know, you can think of uh, buying cigarettes without stamps and going to casinos as kind of the original businesses that Native uh, tribes have gotten into. But through changes in law and um, support of the 8A program, uh, we've become essentially what uh, is called sometimes known as a super 8A. Um, but this becomes important, and, and Cherokee's growth is uh, largely driven by um, those regulations and those um, accommodations that have been made by federal government uh, in some ways as uh, reparations of sort, I guess, of, to, you know, kind of um, repair uh, the culture and the history and the people of these tribal nations. Uh, but, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that's kind of materialized is that um, the kind of key things that matter and the reason we've had uh, such phenomenal growth is that um, within federal government, uh, agencies uh, have direct award authority of up to $25 million in a civilian agency that does not require justification and approval and cannot be protested. So that means that, you know, a civilian federal agency can essentially just say we want to give you a direct award, you have to demonstrate certain capabilities. Um, but the bar is fairly low and uh, we can receive a direct award of up to $25 million to carry out what they want. We're largely left to um, choose our team based on capabilities uh, that help us succeed. Um, but in a Department of Defense environment, that direct award authority is $100 million. It doesn't require any justification or approval and cannot be protested. Uh, and so um, I operate in a DOD environment and government contracting agencies fully understand these rules. Uh, they use them to their benefit, and typically um, when we win a contract, we have hours, days to implement. So one thing that we've become very good at is standing up contracts immediately. So just earlier this week, we had, um, we received a, an award one minute before contract expiration, and we had to kind of rebadge and turn everyone around within a minute, right? Uh, and we did it, right? And, and there was no disruption to the program, but that's the nature of um, how we've grown up and how we operate within the federal government, what the federal government, right, um, demands of us. And so it's been a good partnership. There's certainly challenges in that. Um, but I think that sets the stage for you know, kind of how Mark and I got together and kind of where GCE comes in. Yeah, we uh, really spent a lot of time working with Cherokee as our subcontracting partner in Colorado <clears throat> for our recent award of the Colorado Medical Health Services Contact Center Patient Appointing Services. So one thing I think it's really important, and this is where the homework comes in, it's so important, is uh, GCE has been and, and continues to be approached by a lot of prime contractors. But the cultural fit means so much. Um, and I, I don't know, I know this all sounds warm and fuzzy when at the end of the day we're talking about return on investment, but that time spent up front making sure that that organization, Cherokee, shares the same type of uh, uh, ethics and, and mission focus was a great um, introduction. Um, I flew out to Tulsa, spent a lot of time there at Cherokee at the headquarters meeting everyone from every level, um, verifying that my feelings were right. And then quite frankly, at the end of the day, it comes down to finding a champion, someone who gets it. And Art has been a GCE champion, uh, explaining the benefits of this program at the highest level, uh, as well as um, spreading the word among Cherokee, because Art's one division of many verticals under under Cherokee's umbrella, so uh, we're super excited to be partners with them. And Art and I get to hang out a lot, which is nice too. <laughs> yeah, Mark's persistent, right? And I'm also persistent, <laughs> and I think that you know having two persistent people that share a mission and share a vision uh, is, uh, is very energizing, right? And I think that our clients see it, our organizations see it, and they know that um, you know at the end of the day, right, we know that we're doing the right thing. Right. That you know, there's, there's no question about whether or not we're operating in the right. And uh, you know that that just makes it easy for us. Uh, it's it's hard for anyone to say you know anyone here not agree with you know supporting people with disabilities and getting them meaningful jobs. Right? Yeah, I don't agree with that. I think that's just uh, ridiculous. So you know we're dealing with motherhood and apple pie, and really what we have to do is the the challenges we have is okay, how do you navigate and how do you change old habits? 
right? How do you get people to think new ways? And I think the previous panel had talked about that, right? Be creative. And from your perspective also, Mark, when you're out there talking and, and trying to find a cultural fit like Cherokee Federal, how are you introducing you know, yourself in your organization? How are you, you know, being persistent? So such that Art knew you were persistent even before it, you, you all worked together. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really doing your homework. Like what, what does GCE have to offer a Cherokee? What does PCSI, what does any other of the nonprofits in this room have to offer uh, a Lidos, a GDIT, a Cherokee, no matter who your partnership's with? And then it's making sure that that alignment makes sense. So, you know, um, I noticed when I was out in, in Tulsa that uh, the Cherokee Nation doesn't have a real strong, if any, program related to their tribal uh, constituents as far as accommodation and employment for those who have disability. They have excellent medical coverage. I mean, world-class medical coverage, but no real training to employment program. So I was like, ooh, this is a gap. You know, they got, what, 10 casinos? More than that. More than that now? <laughs> so I mean, there's a lot of jobs here we're talking about. So how can we integrate beyond just being a subcontractor, or in this case, prime to sub? So that's, that's kind of the, where you're looking for, I don't want to call them soft spots, but areas of connection that is more than just a business transaction. Yeah, if I could add on that, because I think that, Please. you know, from the Cherokee perspective, it's like, why bother, right? In other words, like, hey, look, you know, we can always take the easy path, we can go win contracts and we can make money, but uh, there are challenges, right? So within the tribal 8A, right, it's not always wine and roses and things don't always work out as well, but we actually have challenges, right? And one of the key challenges we have is um, retaining a contract right after its period of performance ends. Right, government does not allow a tribal entity to just keep a contract forever, right? There are real rules you have to jump through and you know, we're not allowed to just you know, be the continuous contractor forever. Uh, that um, there are very hard and fast rules. And uh, you know, we've struggled with this because it's, it's challenging. Uh, and one of the things that uh, was immediate uh, was when you take a look at the Ability One program uh, is that it affords an opportunity to retain a contract uh, to perhaps swap places and move GC from in a sub role to a prime role or vice versa. And um, moving a program into uh, an Ability One status uh, provides, quite frankly, a Cherokee with uh, another path in which we can retain work, right? Uh, albeit on a slightly different basis. Um, but, uh, you know, GCE um, gave us an avenue and gave us an opportunity and showed us a strategy in which um, we can, you know, it, it's a tough business when you win a contract and then you lose a contract, then you have to win another contract, right? In other words, it's a zero sum game, right? You're not growing your bottom line. And so the, 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 everyone knows and around the beltway, right? There's no secrets here, right? Is that you have to just keep winning back your contracts and win new ones. When you lose, right, one of your existing contracts, it doubles down and you need to find more new business and new business is really tough in the government environment. Um, and so when we looked at it, we're like, okay, this is a no-brainer, right? In other words, GCE provides us with a path that had no longer, that had never been available to us, we never thought about, um, and that there are some challenges in doing that, but uh, fundamentally, it makes sense, all right, that this is good business. And then when you start to take a look at the mission that they serve and the people that they serve and the families that they help, um, you know, uh, it just starts to build and you get, you start getting this snowballing effect of like, you know, okay, we gotta go, we gotta do this and we have to go talk to people about this and we have to solve this. There's no, re like, why isn't this being done every day, all the time? It seems so obvious, right? Um, and, and I noticed that the more we talk about this, especially at the DHA level, the higher we get in the pecking order of DHA leadership and their interest in what we're talking about. So the other thing I think it's important is Beyond the obvious of what's in it for GCE, uh, there's something that may not be so obvious. You know, Art talked about earlier, they had one minute to transition a contract. Any of you nonprofits in here transition in a contract in one minute or one month or, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we, yeah, Larissa's like, I can do it. Call me up, <laughs> call me up. <laughs> I like that, that's the BD spirit, right? Um, but, you know, for, for us, it takes longer. You know, we have more hoops to jump through. We, our recruiting isn't just go on LinkedIn and grab anybody, right? I mean, if not, then our DLR is going to suffer. So 
the whole thought of transitioning from a subcontractor under, GC, under Cherokee to a prime allows us the time we need to be successful. Yeah. You have five years. Yeah, so I mean, if, if, we can, if we can have that time and recruit and really understand the positions and the accommodations and, and be training people to fill these positions, then it becomes that, that self-licking ice cream cone, right? That, that circle of success that we're trying to build. It can be very challenging, especially in emerging lines of business, for a, for a GC or anyone to be dropped in with very short transition times uh, unless you are prepared to take a considerable hit on your direct labor ratio. Uh, and we won't even get into whether there's a collective bargaining agreement and who has right of first refusal as far as the incumbents go. But, um, you know, it's nice to not have all of the risk and liability on your head up front. I'm not going to lie to you. As a, you know, GCE compared to Cherokee is like so small but yet so critical in their planning moving forward. And ART has been very successful in making GCE part of that. We heard at the earlier panel, uh, they were talking about, you need to get in front of requirements folks early, like when they're doing their work share designation if you're a prime. You know, coming in late doesn't do you any good. They've already got their teams made. So having someone like ART that can be like, well, have you thought about GCE to fill that role? is where you have to, and this is, not, I mean, this has been a couple years work. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And I recommend you do the work because if it's a shortcut, there's a chance you're gonna make a really bad decision and you don't want a bad partner. Yeah. Yeah, so and, you know, I think that the, you know, just to build on that is that, you know, up to this point, right, we've talked about why GCE can help Cherokee and why Cherokee would want a team with the GCE. We've never really talked about the customer at this point, right? So in other words, why would the customers care about any of this? Because it seems like it's pretty good for both of us, right? There's a nice um, relationship that we have here that's quite symbiotic, that we're not necessarily stepping on each other's toes. We don't have um, competition for what positions we might want in a contract. None of this is, is in any way ever comes up in any of our discussions. It's never, there's no friction there whatsoever. It's, it's an easy path. but. Um, I think at the end of the day is that uh, we're making tremendous progress because we have taken the time to meet with the customers at many, many levels and understand you know, what their imperatives are and what's important to them. And we've been able to synthesize this thinking to understand, okay, well, if this is what they're telling us and this is what they need and this is what they value, right, then we have to now go back and we have to think about not us, right, but about them and how it is that we can start to um, make changes within the customer's organization. You know, we all know that change is difficult and it's almost impossible in government, right? People that have uh, agencies that have um, used practices and processes and contract types forever, right, don't change overnight, right? And so uh, the thought of ever having a conversation in which you present uh, a tribal 8A and Ability One partnership, right, to a contracting officer, their heads just explode and melt down. They're like, whoa, hold on a second. These are two separate things. That's oil, this is water. Hold on, that's a whole separate thing. It's like, no, no, we're just a team. We can come in as an 8A. We can transition quickly, right? But what we started to hear from our customers was some pretty amazing stuff, right? So if we dial way back, Mark, right, we, we took a trip with a retired general and um, we we're gonna go visit some customers. And he goes, hey, you know, uh, I, I served in, in these war zones and I really care about these wounded warriors. And if we're gonna go to Walter Reed, then we gotta go visit the soldier recovery unit. We gotta visit these wounded warriors, right? Uh, he was a general and he goes, these, these are my kids. I gotta go see them. And uh, we had a conversation with the people that ran the soldier recovery units. And they kind of took us down this path about these challenges that they have taking care of their kids. And it wasn't the medical care or the rehabilitative care. It's how to get these kids meaningful jobs, right, once they get discharged, right? And they took us through maybe one of the most convoluted processes I'd ever heard where they talk about we give these kids training and it's all paid for and they can choose whatever training they want and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. And we want you guys to you know, be in job fairs. And we're like, we'll always support whatever you want to do. But we started to think about it. And we're like, hold on a second. You're going to have 
some kid that's rehabilitated, you're going to allow them to choose some kind of training, then you're going to throw them into a job fair in hopes that there's a match. So, you know, to me it's like, you know, you're putting the, you know, the horse before the, you know, the cart before the horse. We have to figure this out. This is backwards, right? This is not right. And it wasn't working. I mean, they were saying that... It was a failure. All, all these millions of dollars that were invested in training have not resulted in employment. And one of the other things that came out of it was very interesting, and I didn't realize this, is those, those soldiers going through the soldier recovery unit at Walter Reed, the majority of them are not from here. And their support networks that they need in place to be successful are not here. So we have to be able to build opportunities that are either remote in nature or near these areas where these individuals are. So, so that was a big... Uh, aha for us, followed by a quick trip to Colorado to meet with the customer there, who gave us a whole nut. So we, we've done our homework, right? We know where the problems are. And now, you know, Art and I's real job is really less business development and more innovation in building white papers and strategies to submit to the government and say, have you considered this as a possibility? Yeah. Yeah, we have some, you know, just uh, some amazing things. Like, so you know, we understand and, and you know, uh, I, I support the Defense Health Agency and, you know, that's really kind of a brack for hospitals, right? So it's really the Surgeon Generals of the Army, Navy, and, and Air Force. Um, and they all have this, you know, incredible moral obligation to kids that get hurt in combat, right? Because uh, chances are they were the front line. They were the doctors that actually were treating these kids, whether it be in theater at roll one or roll two or roll three, right? In other words, they were the ones that are taking care of them. They really do deeply care for them. And uh, you have a conversation and you're like, all right, I, I totally understand that you care for these people, um, but you also command an agency that hands out billions and billions of dollars in government contracts. So mm -hmm. what percentage of those contracts are allocated towards helping these kids get jobs? You know, you all care, right? We, we, we've made that really clear, right? That's, that's absolutely crystal clear, but you know, you have choices in terms of how you spend your money, and who you select as a contractor. That's why you select Cherokee versus someone else. Mm -hmm. So if, if you care that much, right, then wouldn't it make sense to take a look at what your contracting practices are and ask yourselves, right, what are we doing? Right. Right. And so a lot of what we've done is, is listened and we've kind of rehashed back to them what we think we've understood, and then we simply ask the next question, right? Well, you know, if you could, would you? Right. Right. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of led us down what we think are some very, very promising paths in which... Um, as recently as today. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we, you know, we, we, we really feel that when you start to understand, uh, again, we started with kind of what's important to GC and Cherokee, right? But at the end of the day, it doesn't win anyone any business, right? That's just a bunch of people talking about, you know, stuff to each other that doesn't result in a contract award. But the, the most important thing is that when you start to kind of take that same process and take a look at gaps that customers have, right? Whether it be in their, their operations or maybe even, you know, uh, how they kind of feel about themselves or the things that they're able to command, right? These are, you know, at the end of the day, all, you know, generals and colonels and admirals and stuff like that, right? They're, they're used to making command decisions. So, yeah. you know, command decision like, gee, we should put aside a few bucks for disabled, you know, veterans in our contracts. It seemed pretty simple, right? That seems like, uh, you know, something that doesn't really take a whole lot of thought. And, and why, why are we just <laughs> talking about it now, right? I mean, uh, this is... None of this is uh, new. It's about really just reorganizing how things are being done as far as the programs go, especially at the SRUs. We have totally not allowed you to. You, I, t I warned no. you. I warned you this was going to be difficult. Y'all are staying pretty close to where okay. the, the line of questions, so the then it makes my job <laughs> easier. <laughs> uh, but, but I did want to note that y'all have been talking about this from the perspective of it sounds like you have a fair bit of buy-in from leadership at the star level. What about the, the program teams, the contracting teams? How is this beneficial to them and do they like this? Um, and because, you know, I think for some of the, the folks here, that's who they're, they may be interacting with as well on a day-to-day -day basis. And how, how are they viewing this? Is this a hassle to them or is this helpful? Well, I think, let me start with that. Yeah, I think no you bring up a very good point. And I, I wasn't in here for the session, but somebody, I think a lawyer, or somebody at the ta my table back there was telling me that um, uh, when Jeff was up here, he was talking about the age of contracting and this, this vacuum that is coming. I mean, there's no avoiding it. 
So you can either sit back and wait for this to happen, or you can put together solutions that you can offer contracting as an easy button. You know what, let me rephrase that. It's not easy. There is nothing easy about, Ms. Zyke, I'm so sorry, N not directed at you, but there's nothing easy about a PL ad, and that is by design, right? It is a big deal to take something out of the competitive market, and I's need to be dotted and T's need to be crossed. So when you look at it from contracting's perspective, when you have the ability, especially when you have an incumbent like Cherokee that's got a proven track record to say, well, I've got this stack of contracts I need to get done. I can quickly, without competition or protest, protest being a huge part of what contracting officers focus on these days, I can make an award. And with this partner GCE, I can feel good about what they're doing. And if it's a great contract and it's suitable for the Ability One program, which we have not talked about, we have, even if I have to keep you over, we have to cover this. <laughs> Okay, because not everything that shines is gold, let me tell you, right? Um, so suitability, if suitability is there in the second or third option year, we can start having those discussions with the contracting officer to retain the talent, to retain the institutional knowledge, to have a workforce that doesn't have such a high turnover. So these are the kind of things or positions that we would then take and then bring to the Ability One Commission for suitability and you know, of course, Source America and get everyone involved at that point. Yeah. About a month ago, I was at a conference and some of our contracting folks were there, the government contract officers and division chiefs and things like that. And so, seven conversation. You know, uh, this agency had put in a um, specific competitive, you know, multi-award IDIQ that was just for them, right? The perfect vehicle, no fee, all kinds of things. And I was talking to a branch chief and I was like, you know, I haven't really seen a lot of activity under this, uh, this vehicle, right? Why would you choose one vehicle over another? Um, and he said, oh, we're just used to it. We're just, we just get so good at doing this one vehicle that we just do that. I was like, oh, but this other vehicle costs you less money. It seems to have a pre-vetted group of people that can solve your problems and are proven performers at your agency. Why would you use this other vehicle? Oh, it's just easy. We just know how to do it. Like some other, you haven't really investigated using the IDAQ that you spent three or four years putting in place because it's just easier to just do it the other way. And they said, oh, exactly. So I was like, okay, got it, right? So change is hard. So to answer your question is that, yeah, for a one-star, two-star, three-star, things are simple. Just command it, get it done, right? But when you get down and, you know, my days, I, I cut my teeth at GE under Jack Welch, and they always said that, you know, the middle management has the hardest job in any corporation because they're the ones that have to push back on change, mm -hmm. right? That when the boss wants it, they have to explain why they can't do it because the workforce will leave and they'll just, you know, forget it. So I think what you have is a situation when you get down to um, certain levels of an organization, they're set in their ways, they do things the way they do things because that's what they like and that's what they're used to. And that any time you introduce something that's different, right, it's like, ugh, you know, don't like it, right? So a lot of the concepts that Mark and I bring to them um, can't really be positioned that way. You have to position it a different way because it's all about them, right? right? In other words, they're the gatekeepers and they're the ones that can make it happen. And so you have to understand what makes them tick, right? And you have to be able to take what your value proposition is and make it valuable to them. And that value proposition will change person by person. So it's not a one size fits all. Yeah, so not a lot of magic, it's just that change is hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and on that perspective of change being hard, how much do you talk about the lower turnover rate for employees within the Ability One well, program? Well, and let me, I'll address that because we don't talk about it. The customer talks about it. So when you start to kind of interview these clients, and I, you know, I, I manage a very large portfolio of contracts that, yeah. you know, is very, very valuable to Cherokee. It means everything to our nation, right? It, it drives cultural and economic, right, uh, differences in a group of people that have uh, been given quite a raw deal by the United States of America through its entire history, right? Um, it is, uh, the customers will sit there and they'll tell you how much they hate any kind of turnover in staff. We had one lab director who had said, if I lose one investigator, one research investigator, that sets us back two years. I can't have turnover in my program. And if you go program to program, we, Colorado, uh, our customer had said, um, 
you know, gee, these uh, TRICARE networks of providers are very, very complicated. The specializations they have, whether they're in network and whether they're approved to do care, is not easy. There is no FAQ, you know, FAQ that you can put on a website that solves all these problems. It comes through understanding and having the experience of doing this time and time again. And so when you ask the customers, like, you know, what's really important to you in terms of your contractor workforce, almost exclusively they say retention of staff and retention of domain knowledge. So when you look at it that way and you kind of think about what a tribal 8A and what an ability one provider can do together is that that provides them this enormous, generous runway to retain staff. Um, and kind of capture that domain knowledge and continue to grow on it. So it's, that's what's important to them. Uh, but on top of that, I think that uh, the other things that, uh, that they had identified is that um, people with disabilities who have been accommodated in the workplace don't get up and quit and go to another job, all right? And so when you think about it, it's like if you value stability, all right, and, and domain capture of domain knowledge, and if you employ some percentage of your workforce with disabilities, the chances are, if you give them a pathway to keep that job, they will really, really appreciate it and they'll continue to do a better and better job over time, and that is what government wants, right? That is what they treasure, that's what they value when you're at that program manager level of government, that mid-level management. And so listening to them and just kind of taking a look at how we operate and what we can do, right, starts to kind of change the whole paradigm. It's like, well, if you could retain your team and you could have long-term contracts, right, that allow you to continue to develop your workforce and develop your capabilities and improve uh, what you deliver, right, to, to your agency or to the constituency or whatever your audience is, you know, would you do that, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, I'd do it in a second. It's like, okay, well, you know, then That's let's all go we're do bringing it. to the table. Right, let's go do it, right? Yeah. Words, like, all of your alternatives are much worse, right? Right, that they're, they're fatalistic in that, you know, it will always end in, um, a bad result and in, 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 in the consequence that you dreaded the most. And so it's like, well, so why would you continue to do that to yourself, right? Wouldn't you look at another way of doing it that makes more sense, that's aligned to your needs, right? To what you get, what you value, what you know through your experience, right? Has been, you know, the, the start and stop um, within your own, you know, cadence. So- And, and then the closing on that is the mission. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you notice here, the focus has been on from, and I, and I say this as part of the mentor-protege group, is there's a three-legged stool here, right? There is, there is the, the work that the NBA or the partnership does, there's the individual who is being served, and then there's the customer and the government. And depending on which one of those legs of the stool you're talking about, this conversation changes. And this is a great, can I jump off on the suitability? Yeah, well, well okay. exactly, because I was going to ask you that. Okay, great. I feel like you're, you're Mark, tell us about mind. suitability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I, I wanted to a ask what are things Ability One um, nonprofits need to be considering whenever they're looking for these relationships? And I know suitability is one of the, the big things you were talking about, even on the contract side. Yeah, so w what I mean by this is, uh, again, I'm turning the stool to focus on the individual now. So. In this relationship, what we are proposing to the individual that is being served is that this individual will be appropriately trained and accommodated to work on a specific contract to do a specific thing with a glide path for advancement. Now, I want you to park that for a second and I want everyone to imagine a pyramid. And this pyramid is a representation of FTEs on a contract. So let's say you have an enterprise IT contract, and for easy math, because I am no accountant, it's 100 people. And let's say that that pyramid, the way that the FTE or labor force is, is broken up is you have a large layer of entry level, maybe service desk, contact center individuals, and then a next step, as you go up the pyramid, right, the positions get less, the next step is a mid-level, maybe programmer or uh, quality assurance software tester, and so forth and so on. Because at the end of the day, what GCE is looking to do for Cherokee is take away what we would consider, and this is a term that Light has provided to me, so I'm not gonna take credit for it, the high turnover, low margin positions. 
Now, in the regular business world, you'd hear that and be like, I don't want that. High <laughs> turnover, low margin positions. Why would I want to do that? But that's not our mission. Our mission is to bring people into those positions, create stability, right, at that bottom level of the pyramid so that you have low turnover, knowledge is being gained, and then individuals can be promoted. Our goal is to promote them off of our payroll and onto Cherokee's payroll, by the way, at no cost. This is a try before you buy a situation. If this individual is capable of advancing and we can open up that chair for someone else to get a shot, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Isn't, isn't that the end goal of all of this? Now, I'm gonna turn the stool again. So what happens, so we talked about what's in it for Cherokee. Uh, I can take away some of your HR nightmare of having to recruit all the time. For a lot this, of the cost too. A lot of the costs that go with it. I'll recruit for you for free and you can hire these people. So there's great ROI there for them. So that's the easy piece. But for the customer, it goes back to this continuity of being able to have a reliable workforce who is dedicated to the mission of that customer. And I will tell you, if, you've, if you ever get a chance to get out to Colorado Springs and you can visit our site, it is not any place more evident than in Colorado that they cherish the people that they serve. The patient experience is so important and that permeates through everything that GCE and Cherokee does there. Uh, it is the primary focus, and that has been uh, our really avenue to success out there, is we share their focus, right? Yeah, I also wanna add is that, uh, you know, for me, an eye-opener, right? Because you know, a lot of stuff that we talk about is kind of motherhood and apple pie, and it's the right thing to do, and we all kind of feel that moral imperative in, in how we act and the things that we do, but, um, you know, for the audience out here is that one of the things that kind of changed for me, right, why do I, why would I do this, is Mark invited me to the Source America conference. X-Force. And, and, and he really, X-Force, and he encouraged, he made sure, he wanted to check my flights, wanted to know when I'm going to be there, and if I'm in a hotel nearby, and he wanted to make sure I was going to really be there. Um, <laughs> Soccer. Uh, but what was, you know, what was most amazing to me is the things that I had heard and, you know, the sessions that I sat in on. So I remember there was one session where the ability one, you know, Source America Ability One teams were saying that, you know, they win these contracts and, you know, they almost fail at startup, right? Is that, you know, as Mark expressed earlier, it's like, it's hard to get, you know, a team where the majority of contractors are disabled. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. It's like, yeah, well, that's really tough. Um, I, I can't imagine that have to be a really difficult situation, especially when we kind of take a look and we juxtapose it to how we operate in Cherokee. It's like, we're ready to go, ready to go, ready to go. Um, I was like, that's, gee, that we never would even encounter something like that. That mm -hmm. seems completely odd. Um, and so we started, I started to hear things about their business, right? That were the other one that just, uh, I, I was in this one session where a fellow was talking about all this data analysis they've done and uh, they're trying to find new avenues for Ability One contractors and uh, he's going through this tremendous data analysis and he's like, you know, bottom line is that we've kind of maxed out on janitorial and custodial services, right? We don't think there's any growth there. And I just kind of thought to myself, it's like, who on earth decided that if you have a disability, you have to push a broom or sweep, or sweep a mop? Yeah. Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I mean, doesn't make any sense. The right? whole thing was a complete non sequitur. Like, right. oh, this is totally bananas. What are we talking about here? And then I think about um, today's soldiers, right? These are our kids, right? And they grew up with iPhones, they grew up in the computer era, they grew up with all of these, all this text, things that a lot of us, you know, had to kind of learn, but it was intuitive to them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so you're serving the country, you're 21 years old, right? You get disabled, and your future for the next 60 years having to serve the United States of America is you get to push a broom. And in five years, you're gonna have to go find another contract to jump on to push a broom somewhere else. And I was like, these people can do a lot more than that there's so much more that they can do. And like, why are we in any way cubbyholing into this? Well, why do we think as in government that this is a good thing? You know, it's, it's an insult. Mm -hmm. It's an insult to think that, all right, we've, we've given all of our janitorial and custodial jobs to disabled people and now we're all good. Yeah, check the you box, know? right? Everyone's cool. It's <laughs> like, you know, well, I don't think that, I don't think that's the case. And we know that that's not the case. We know that the training and the background of today's kids 
uh, is far in excess of anything we could ever imagine from a technical perspective. Yeah. And that, to me, it seems like the best jobs for them are those that are in um, high tech. I, I learned something very valuable in my By life. By the way, if you're disabled, is it really easy to push a broom around? <laughs> right, depending on the disability. I mean, it seems disability. to me it's easy, like, you know, maybe answer a phone, hop on a screen, <laughs> right, uh, solve some problems, do some analysis. Seems to me more in line, right? But to think that even physical work, right, is where we're going to put our disabled people and we're going to feel good about it is like, are you out of your mind? Yeah. Right? But one of the <laughs> things I learned in the work I did with the VFW was the changing demographic of the post 9-11 veteran, disabled veteran, and how what we are talking about now, really the, the traditional lines of business, we're all really more focused towards that pre 9-11, right? The, the Vietnam era veteran. And so even an organization the size of the VFW is changing what they're offering uh, their constituency because they have made the realization and, and recognition that this, this new group of individuals that requires this level of care and service, they have different uh, ideas of what jobs and careers are. And, and quite frankly, you know, with, with uh, the saturation of food service, grounds, and custodial within the Ability One program, we have to be looking at other avenues. I mean, just simply have to. That's yeah, just the right thing to do, bottom line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're insane if we think that that's our future, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're morally corrupt as a country if we believe that. Right. Right. I, I can't say, I don't think anyone in this room says, no, our, you know, people with disabilities should only have custodial jobs or, or uh, you know, serve food on a buffet, right? Right. Like, you know, I disagree. You know, well, I, I, I will. I will disagree, and I'll. I'll, I'll argue <laughs> that point to anybody. Passionately, yes. I yeah. do think it's actually our time to hear if there are comments from the audience to. to argue with you. Um, I don't think they're going to, but but I know we we do need to have some audience question time, and so I I see a microphone passed over here already, so I'll, I'll pass the hey, mic to Joe you. Hey, Joe Diaz with Melwood. Mark, first I have to give you kudos. I have never heard anybody say a self-licking ice cream cone. I kind of <laughs> like that. Oh, there very, you go. Cool, <laughs> I say. Um, I got to imagine you went through quite a few, you went through your own process to find Cherokee. And I'm just curious about your process you went through and how many organizations did you meet with where nothing happened out of that? Oh, I kissed a lot of frogs to find a prince, I will tell you right now. <laughs> Uh, I met with other tribal aid aides, um, Bofin. Um, we were doing some work as a as a partner on a DSS project in Alabama with um, Chugosh. So we we already had some like connections and relationships, and you know I, I've wanted to. I'm a BD guy. You know, I'm, it's hard for me to say no to anything, which as a person in general, but it, it's intensified because of my job. But um, but it it was. Uh, it's been a great learning experience. I would say, I would say probably five solid organizations that I explored to how can we advance what we have to offer in the alignment that works best for said prime or said partner. It doesn't always have to be prime. And also in the spirit of, you know, the forthcoming mentor protege program and what, what can that look like? How can that be leveraged here? to advance the program for everyone that's in this room. Because someone has to do it first. And it's painful and it's bloody uh, to be the first one through the door. It is. But someone has to do that so we can expand what the government understands about what the capacity of this workforce is. Okay. I think we have another question over here at the same table. Same table, imagine that. Good afternoon, <laughs> Bradley Crane, Workforce Development Program Manager for the Commission. Just a quick question, you mentioned about going off what uh, Mr. Diaz said about finding that right partner. Can you speak more to the employee level between this prime and the sub of the culture that you've maintained for the employees between Cherokee Nation and you as an ability one provider? What does that look like and how At the project level? Match? Say it again. Are you saying at the project level? Yeah, the project okay. level. Yeah, well, um, you know, with any transition, you have to understand that um, a lot of the workforce uh, that uh, came over from the Colorado contract were incumbent workforce. So having a partner like Cherokee who 
can help with that transition so that we can mitigate negative impact to DLR. You see, the thing you have to understand with these emerging lines of business is there's a punitive side here. There's a punitive side because if you don't have the ability to ramp up over time, and I'm not talking about ramping up for a custodial contract. I'm talking about ramping up where people have to have certifications in like Security Plus and, and things that take time, training, and effort, then you have to hire a lot of people that are non-disabled, and that is punitive to your organizational DLR. So what By the way, it's perfect for us. Yes, yes. yes. Well, it, that's easy what easy workforce, like that's an easy button. You know, that's the mark. symbiotic relationship. To make this work and protect corporate DLR, we have to find ways to advance what we're doing, to create this, this workforce and, and, and capability statement, right? Past performance while not being excluded from the program because of a DLR impact. That's really the balancing act there. And having a partner like Cherokee really helps us because they understand the mission of what we're trying to do in there. It's not just lip service. It's not like, hey, we're just gonna go win the contract and do nothing to work to move this contract over to an Ability One contract. There's incentive for them to do it, and from a moral perspective, they want to do it. And that's the piece that you have got to lock down. Does that answer your question? I think I see one more hand in the back. <laughs> so I just want to thank you all very much for your support of veterans. I'm an SD, VOSB, WSB, and a hub zone. And, <laughs> and I worked all. on the commission, so I have um, a real compelling reason to want to do these types of relationships myself. Um, you are, sir, Art Spring, a, a real unicorn because I've talked to a lot. I actually subcontract for another 8A, and the care and compassion that you have is not evident with all eight A's because they don't have the motivation. They get the direct awards and sometimes they bring us up on their team because they need all those little certifications I just mentioned and forget about us. Um, so to see this type of relationship, this is to me the gold standard. And um, I just congratulate both of you. And that was my comment. My question is, it's a little harder for those of us who are actually competing. Um, they're set-asides, but we all have to compete for the set-asides. And I'm still wrapping my arms around what those partnerships will look like in this um, competitive world of competing and bringing along nonprofits who are breaking into these new lines of work. Because I'm an IT business, so I, wanna, I want this to be a mutual thing and to use a good army term, a self-licking ice cream cone. <laughs> so, uh, one, you know, th th thank you. I, you I know, just I want don't, your thoughts. Um, that, that was a very, very kind statements, and I appreciate that. But let's kind of talk policy and regs, right? Let's kind of dive into that. Let's kind of talk about what it's all about. Um, uh, OMB Memoranda 2311, 2203, Executive Order 13985, right? These are all things in which the federal government has determined that uh, as a result, primarily of category management, they had unintended consequences, and that was that it drove small businesses out of federal contracting. It was the, had the unintended consequence, the opposite effect of what the plan was. Instead, the bigger companies scooped up all the contracts, consolidated them, they held all the IDIQs because they had past performance and they could get a spot on an IDIQ, and uh, that kind of um, upset the apple cart over the last, you know, five, 10, 20 years. So um, when, when, when we look at it, you know, you have to understand the policy and the reg environment and, and what's out there. And what I look at is, you know, who's on, who's in, right? Who really understands it? Because, uh, you know, what Mark and I are doing is we're not chasing people's expiring contracts, right? We're taking a look at gaps that government has, right? Needs that they that are unmet, right? And coming up with novel solutions to this. And yeah, we want to write PWSs, not respond to them. Yeah, uh, but the other part is that, um, you know, when when we look at it as Cherokee, right, is that th there are selfish eight days. And, you know, look, we fall in that trap every once in a while. But the bottom line is that if you really want to kind of capture the attention of the senior contracting officials, the people that 
uh, are doing the, the reviews of the acquisition approach. The people who have to sign off on whatever the contract officer and the program want to do is that uh, when we look at it, uh, we say, look, you know, we are a very, very large data, right? And that um, we are not looking for handouts and government does not expect us to, to ask for handouts. Is that they know that over time we've, we've performed on massive contracts as a prime contractor. And um, what that says to me is that, you know, the zero sum game, right, of kind of having eight A's all kind of steal from each other, right, just probably like you do in the Ability One program is like, well, you know, I'm, I'm an 8A, there's an 8A contract expiring, I'm gonna grab that, right? And at the end of the day, right, there, there's no additional small business <coughs> contracting or dollars, right? It's a zero sum game. Yeah. And so when we look at it, and the simple thing that you can take, you know, when you talk to people who are small business, uh, office of small business, it's like, you know, their, their goals have increased significantly, right, under the Biden administration. And so if you play the zero sum game, right, you're never gonna make your number. Right, and what you have to do is you have to take a look at where your full and open contracts are, and you have to pull those into an 8A program, maybe an Ability One program. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing that, the value proposition is that just use, you know, choose, choose a company, right, Northrop, Lidos, whoever, right. When you award a full and open contract, right, you might get 20% small business participation, and within that, it all gets kind of divvied up. Well, you're a WOSB, and there's an SBVOSB, and you know, here's an 8A, we're going to be 2%, 1%, whatever, right? It's, I did this when I was at SAC. I ran, I ran a large division there. Um, you know, give me a break, right? That's ridiculous, right? That's stupid. If you take a proven contractor like a Cherokee that's performed on contracts as big as $1 billion, and we can get it done, right? Then 100% of every dollar that government spend goes into the 8A program. On top of that, I can add another value proposition, right? I can now start to build a teaming relationship with um, new entrant, recent entrant, woman-owned small businesses, all those things that the administration under their executive orders and guidance have prioritized. And I can say that I can now bring, with this single award, I can give 100% of its money to your 8A program, right, and meet your small business goals. But on top of that, I can bring a team of qualified companies with me that are small businesses, and by hiring one small business, one 8A, you can now increase by three, four, five-fold the number of small businesses that are now participating in federal government that don't have the program management experience and the size of the programs that Cherokee does, and we can help them along. That's how we work with GC. That's how we work with other companies. These are all new concepts, right? These are all things that are different ways of doing business. And what I say is that, look, you know, if you get it and you're on board and you really want to make a contribution, right, you see the mission that, that Mark and I are on, right, is that um, we can't, we can't afford to have old thinking contractors on our team, right? They all want a handout or they want this or that. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, this is hard, right? This takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort, right? It takes years of business development to do this. And so for those companies that are willing to step outside of the comfort zone to be part of the solution, we love having them, right? But the bottom line is that, you know, the way things used to get done really are not attractive, you know, to me and to our management because we have other expect, you know, expectations are placed on us by government that um, other 8As don't have and we have to be able to respond to that and we have to be able to show them that we understand, we study, we analyze, we assess, and we can come up with better mousetraps for government. All right, thank, yeah, thank you. I think that's a great way to end on, of just explaining, you know, that this is still true business development even you know from either the the nonprofit side or the uh, non um, nonprofit side as a federal contractor, it's always thinking about the customer first. So thank you all so much for for this panel. I know we're at time, um, so I'll let you move on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.